Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salim. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, I am Dr. Ahmed Said, oral surgeon and specialist in infection control. When I received the invitation from Dr. Adnan Habib to be a part of the online dentistry congress, I thought about which topic I will present. What are the important topics to dentists for infection control? Would I present the gowns, gloves, mask, barrier technique? What will I speak about? Actually, nowadays, in 2019, most of dentists are expert in infection control. I think it's not acceptable now that there is a dentist who is unaware of proper infection control precautions. So, I would like to focus on a very important four tips. The first topic I would present, I will start by a very important question. You are a dentist. Have you ever received the hepatitis B vaccination? Hepatitis B vaccine actually is made from parts of the hepatitis B virus, but actually it doesn't cause hepatitis B infection. So, hepatitis B vaccine, as the regular regimen we are all aware about, is formed of three shots of vaccine. They are given at zero, one, and six months interval, this recommended dose vaccination. Nowadays, there is an update. In the United States, the Hibli's have or Dynavax is a new trend of hepatitis B vaccine. It's formed only of two doses with 28 days interval. It's recommended only for adults above 18 years old. Okay, now you already terminated your three doses of hepatitis B vaccine. Does this mean that you are fully immunized? This depends on a very important investigation, which is called the hepatitis B surface antibody titter. The hepatitis B surface antibody titter, when you are interpreting the result, if the titter is above 12 micro gram international unit per milliliter blood, this means that you are fully immunized. What will, ha what will happen if your titter is below 10? This means that you did not respond to the vaccine. So we will discuss the non-responders to the hepatitis B vaccine. The non-responders are the persons who did not develop a protective surface antibody after completing the full series of hepatitis B vaccine. So what we should do for these people? We have to re-give them again a three doses of hepatitis B vaccine. We will repeat the regimen again on zero, one, and six months interval. What, what is the percentage of response to a second three doses or an next three doses of hepatitis B vaccine, the percentage of response ranges from 30 to 50 percent. Again, if a person terminated his second three doses of hepatitis B vaccine and again he did not uh, have the proper antibody tether or surface antibody tether which is above 12, what shall we do? We have to go to another regimen. We have to give them hepatitis B immunoglobulin. Again, two doses with one month interval. Now, we will give a brief video which shows the importance of personal protective equipment and barrier technique. Why we much care about these issues. Let's go this through this video which will show us if a doctor and his assistant are careless. Let's start with. If 
if we inject the major salivary glands with a dye, with a red dye, you see the color of saliva and how much it is spread all over the surfaces. We will see what will happen now. Now the assistant is preparing the patient for the doctor work. The doctor will start his procedures as usual. Okay, let's see what will happen now. We will discover together the mistakes the doctor and his assistant are committing. Now he started to examine. Okay, patient teeth. Again, saliva is injected with a red dye. System is working. Doctor also is working. Now she received a telephone call. Okay, how she will behave when she when we receive when she receives a telephone call during work. She will answer with her gloves. Here, she will touch her ring. And her hair piece. Again, doctor, touch the sheet of the patient with hands. Oh, touch his face also with gloves. Let's see what happened during this procedure when we injected the saliva with the red dye. You will see how saliva spread over the surfaces that were taught by the doctor and the assistant. Now see what happened when she received the telephone call and she replied. You see there is saliva on the doctor's face. Also, there is saliva on the telephone, on here, on piece or a ring, and on patient sheet. And on the scanner. All surfaces are infected with saliva. The light also is infected with saliva. The cotton box, cotton, all cotton became infected and caused. The surfaces became infected with saliva. The mirror. Okay. We will go to a second topic which will discuss about dental unit water lines. You see here the plumbing system of dental unit. Here the picture show the water inflow through the pipes and the red mark shows the biofilm formation which causes contamination to the end user which is the handpiece. Dental unit water lines can get contamination by microbes or bacteria from uh, three different sources. This is the, the traditional speaking about dental unit water lines. It can acquire infection through the incoming main water, which, which is possible source of legionella and microbacteria species. Also from the sac back of oral bacteria via dental hand pieces and from hands of surgery by sac back again, via sac back again. Uh, all of these things recently became rare and became unuseful because the new trends and new technologies of hand pieces and dental units has an anti-retraction valves or anti-regarge valves which prevent disinfection from taking place. Yani, uh, we mean that hand pieces now having an anti-retraction valves, uh, dental units have anti-retraction valves through so the suck pack now become rare with the new technologies. But what we are afraid from? We are afraid from 
pine film formation in the dental unit water lines. Dental unit water lines which are not treated, okay, it can harbor a bacteria. The contaminating bacteria are able to multiply to form to form a biofilm in the inner surface of dental unit water lines. Biofilm forms rapidly and within a week it starts shedding large number of bacteria into the water lines. What are the factors which promote the formation of this biofilm? Dental unit water lines are made from micropore tubing that have a large surface area to volume ratio. Also, overnight stagnation of water inside the water lines and relatively low levels of water usage when the dental unit is not in use or rarely used and also the rarely or unused outlets. This all can harbor bacteria and form a biofilm. So, how we could maintain a proper water quality in the dental unit water lines? We have actually to flush the dental unit water lines at the start of every day for 2 minutes and also from 20 to 30 seconds between patients. Also, we have to use continuous or short purges of disinfection or biocides. Now we have many available commercial types of biocides. Uh, there are daily and weekly types of biocides. And we have to follow the manufacturer instructions which match the dental unit we have. We have to do proper service and maintenance of dental hand pieces and anti retraction valves in the dental unit water lines. And the type of water which is used in the dental units, we have to use distillized or reverse osmosis treated water in the self-contained water bottles. The water is prohibited or should be avoided from use. Also, we have to drain down the dental unit water lines at the end of the day. Self-contained water bottles have to be removed and disinfected with a proper biocide. And again, we have to flush the dental chairs that are not used at least twice per week. Let's go to the third topic which speaks about the sterilizers. The small sterilizers or the autoclaves. We will not discuss the central sterilization or central units. We will discuss the small autoclaves, which are used in the private clinics. Loading of the instruments inside the autoclave is a very important issue. We have to use to load the sterilizer according to manufacturer's instructions and according to specified validations. We have to ensure that instruments are not overlapping inside the sterilizer. Open hinged instruments to expose all the surfaces to the steam. We have to plate the instruments on a perforated tray or cassettes or racks that have been validated for the use with the selected sterilization cycle. We have to avoid overloading the sterilizing chamber or individual trays with instruments. Again, we will discuss the water which is used for the autoclaves. The, the water which is used for sterilization should be essentially free from chemicals and endotoxins. Again, the use of tap water is totally prohibited as it can lead to the buildup of contaminants that may be harmful to the autoclave. Sterilization logbook or daily registration is very important so that it could provide useful evidence in the event of adverse incident. Handling and storage of wrapped instruments immediately after sterilization. We have to check the wrapped material for any, dumb, for any dumbness, for any tearing, for any broken seal or any damage. Please do not place the newly sterilized wrapped instrument packs on a coal or solid surfaces. Why? Because they are, these items are cooling fast and are in vulnerable state and the warm vapor leaving the pack can condense to form a dew that twists the wrapped material. 
If the wrapped items or bags is wet or dropped in the floor of on the floor or torn or broken seal, so it's no more sterile. You have to again unwrap and decontaminate and re-sterilize. Do not return the pack again to the autoclave without re-doing re decontamination again. Do not store the instruments on open shelving or on the work surfaces in the clinical area and use first in first out stock. The new instruments are stored on the pack. Then we use the old sterilized instruments first. The periodic testing of the autoclave is a very important issue via biological, chemical, and mechanical indicator. Again, the registration in the logbook that you did the proper periodic testing is very important. The final topic will be about amalgam mercury vapor, which is a great concern nowadays. Mercury vapor levels in the air are believed to be unhealthy if they are at or above 0.05 microgram per cubic meter at 10 hours average. Actually, mercury is naturally occurring element. We are exposed to methyl mercury when we eat fish, when we eat tuna, when we eat sell fish, when we eat any sea foods. So, already we are exposed to mercury. But the most important what is the safety level of mercury? As we, as we said in the last slide, that mercury fever, which is above or at 0.05 microgram per cubic meters at 10 hours time, this is considered unsafe. But all what we are speaking about is below the mentioned level. Even amalgam fever, is below this level if we are following the proper ventilation and infection control precautions. So, is amalgam safe according to what we stated? Is amalgam a safe restoration? This is the issue now. Everyone today is speaking about amalgam safety. Is amalgam safe? Is mercury vapor safe or it's toxic? Actually, there are many studies on the safety of amalgam filling have been done. In 2009, United States Food and Drug Administration (FDA) they made a research. They found or they concluded that there is no reason to limit the use of amalgam. They concluded that amalgam is a safe restriction for patients who are above six years old. This is the website because I know there is dilemma and uh, there are arguments about safety of amalgam. Please read from FDA. Depend on the FDA data and follow this link to read more about amalgam. If we follow proper precautions, will amalgam bears be safe or no more safe? So, once amalgam is safe, why dentists are concerning about saving of amalgam during the handling? Because dentists work on a mercury almost every day. Every day, dentist is exposed to mercury vapor. So they have to take a safety precautions. Without protection, now we speak about without protection, without proper ventilation, without mask, without eye protection, so that dentists can inhale mercury vapors over time. By this, they are susceptible to symptoms of mercury toxicity. We usually concern about mercury not in the condensation of amalgam, but mostly in the removal of amalgam. Really, mercury vapor is dangerous when we are removing amalgam, not when we are condensing amalgam. We have to protect our patients from additional mercury exposure by adhering to the guidelines which were stated by the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Technology. We have to keep the filling cool or we have to do a copious amount of coolant by using cold water spray with copious amount of water. We have to use a high volume suction when we are removing amalgam, not the traditional suction. We have to use a high volume suction. Actually, the high volume suction, it's not suction for saliva. It sucks the, the, the vapor of restorations and the large things. It's not 
sucking saliva. Saliva can be sucked by the low volume suction. And immediately we have to change patients' protective wear and clean their faces. We have to consider appropriate nutritional support and detoxification before, during, and after amalgam removal, the proper food beverage. And we have to install the room air purifiers, purifiers or ionizers and fans. And now the recent EC technology air conditioners have all uh, the ionizers and cleaning filters. So no need for all this. Only proper EC available. Recent EC can cover all this point. Really, it was my honor to be a part of online dentistry. Special thanks to Prof. Adnan Habib, to Dr. Mazin, for inviting me to be a part of this Congress. I really appreciate that. I'm very happy to be a part from this conference. Thank you very much and goodbye.